Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Parkminster United Church. My name is Jaden Jones, and I will be presiding over worship with you all. And uh, so I would like to invite Neil to start with our prelude. Thank you, Neil. And I would like to invite our candle lighters up for to the altar, please. It is the season of beginning, of rebirth, of resurrection. In the season of both Easter and spring, we light our candles together, reminding us that we are connected as a community, uh, as seekers, as followers of Jesus the Christ in this time and place. Just as our flames move to the currents of the air, may we be moved by the promptings of the Spirit in this time and these places of worship. Let us continue with this time of gathering with our statement of welcome. I would like to invite John Bacliar to lead us in our statement of welcome. Good morning. Happy Mother's Day. This is our statement of welcome. In gratitude and with respect, we begin by recognizing the First Nations on whose traditional land we make our spiritual home. 
the Anna Schwabe, the Hudenosche, and the Neutral. That this history has been successful. Along with the rest, along with the First Nations everywhere, we recognize the earth as our mother, upon whose water, air, and soil we depend for our lives and our well being. We acknowledge that as a species, we have not acted with respect for our precious planet. We commit to learning and practicing better stewardship. Seeking true community, we welcome all who have no church home, need strength, and are seeking a deep meaning. For those who have doubts or who do not believe, Welcome to those whose faith is sure and those who believe but are asking larger questions. Welcome to visitors and to family friends. Welcome to grandparents, to mothers, fathers, youth and children, couples and single people. Welcome to each who is seeking the, an understanding of community and what it means to accompany one another. As we come together as church, we hold one another in gratitude and pray that we will be strong together, faithful together and loving together. We seek blessing as we welcome the great gift of the Spirit in us, through us and among us. Thank you very much for that, John. And I want to once again welcome you all to Park Minister United Church and our worship service today. A quick reminder to those of you who are on Zoom that if you're having any technical issues, please alert the AV team by sending them a message in the chat. And uh, if anyone has an announcement and they are here in the sanctuary, please come forward. Uh, while you're doing that, I just want to go over a couple of things. As many of you know, my name is Jaden Jones. Uh, I am a member of this congregation, but I am also a student at Emmanuel College and a candidate for, for ordained ministry with the United Church. Uh, and I just want to let you all know that uh, Reverends Heather and Joe are away this weekend after attending the semi-annual meeting of the Western Ontario Waterways region. They are back for next Sunday's service, where four new members will be welcomed to Parkminster. And uh, next Sunday, May 15th, just as a reminder, uh, all children are invited to the next in-person outdoor Sunday school event. Please dress for being outside and participating in activities. And if you're interested, please contact Reverend Heather if you have any questions. And uh, just one more quick note for the folks on Zoom. We won't be having our online chat after the service this week. And I'd like to call this forward, forward for an announcement. Good morning. In February, we recognized Black History Month at Parkminster. Each family received a Black History Month calendar with prompts and questions, encouraging us to have probing conversations and reflection about ideas around racial justice, identity, and our personal engagement or lack thereof with the topic of racism. The prompt for the final week was inspired by, in part by an essay by Adele Holliday the anti-racist, racism, and equity officer for the United Church. It was this, in a concrete way, what might transformation look like for us as a church? Each one of us was asked to consider the different spheres we engage with at Parkminster, from social groups, to Sunday school, music, to committees, and to write down what changes could be made to make these spheres more inviting in the deep sense of the word. What tangible steps might we take to honor our commitment to being an actively anti-racist church? How might we find a new way of being in the world with one another? Maybe you had some great ideas, 
Maybe you had some possibly okay ideas and maybe you were at a total loss. Regardless, you're invited with open arms to join a conversation about this transformation by attending a really important virtual meeting on Wednesday, May 18th at seven o'clock. Adele Halliday herself will, has generously agreed to facilitate this conversation for Parkminster in which we share our ideas for these tangible steps, as well as addressing some of the obstacles, including not knowing, that may be in our way. We all make Parkminster together, so if transformation is to happen, we all have a place in that transformation. Please write Wednesday, May the 18th at 7 p.m. on your calendar and come be a part of this conversation. A link to the meeting will be sent out closer to the date. We sure hope that you'll come to this. Good morning. Uh, my name is John Watson. <laughs> it's been a while since. <laughs> So I'd like to invite everybody to a real live in-person event that's going on every Wednesday night from here until the end of August. Uh, food trucks have returned. This is not a ritual event. This is in-person. But I do need a little bit of assistance along the way. Uh, I've reduced the tasks at hand for volunteers to largely a social event in its own, but there is a little bit of light labor involved. So if you're interested at all in helping out with food trucks, see me after the service and I will put your name down on the list. Thank you very much. Good morning. So uh, uh, next weekend is the Messe de Saint Anne, which Grace Ronan and I will be performing in. I know an email was sent out uh, in the WhatsApp uh, of providing that information, but uh, I just thought I'd give you guys a little bit of context as to that mass. It was written by a student at Laurier. He's a past student now. Um, and St. Anne is only found in the Quran. So my roommate is the conductor. He's very much into uh, all this kind of stuff. And he had never heard of St. Anne, so he was very interested in this mass. And uh, the whole theme of this concert is acceptance across religions and peace and, you know, all, all, all that good stuff. So I just hope to see some of you there. Uh, the link to get those tickets is in that WhatsApp, so feel free to look there. And there's also a poster in the hallway with the coats, so if you'd like some more information, you can check that out. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. And let us continue our time of gathering with our opening hymn. It can be found in the Spiral Ground, More Voices, number 178, Who is My Mother?
And now, as we prepare to hear the words of our faith, I'd like to invite you into prayer. Holy One, speak to us again as we hear the stories of our faith traditions. Be with us as we open our minds and our hearts to your word. Holy One, your message comes to us as in words that have been passed down through the ages. Help us to reflect on them through the lens of both history and contemporary experience. May the story of our faith guide, inspire, and provoke. Thanks be to you. Amen. And I would like to invite John to come up and read the scripture reading for today. Our scripture reading this morning is from the our, from our faith tradition comes from Acts 9 verses 36 to 43. I have a slightly different version here than that of what's in your pew Bible. But if you like to follow the reading with me, it can be found on page 28, Acts 9 verses 36 starting. I'll give you a moment to find it. Down the road away in Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha, gazelle in our language. She was well known for doing good and helping out. During the time Peter was in the area, she became sick and died. Her friends prepared her body for burial and put her in a cool room. Some of the disciples had heard that Peter was visiting in nearby Lydda and sent two men to ask if he would be so kind as to come over. Peter got right up and went with them. They took him to the room where Tabitha's body was laid out. Their old friends, most of them widows were in the room mourning. They showed Peter pieces of clothing that Gazelle had made while she was still with them. Peter put the widows all out of the room. He knelt and prayed, and then he spoke directly to the body. Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes. When she saw Peter, she sat up. He took her hand and helped her up. Then he called in the believers and the widows and presented her to them alive. When this became known all over Joppa, many put their trust in the master. Peter stayed on a long time in Joppa as a guest of Simon the Tanner. This is the good news for all who need it. May we be blessed with a deep need for grace.
Again, I have to say it is an absolute honor to be leading us in worship this morning, uh, especially right here in the sanctuary after so long of being out. And it's got me reflecting on this lovely, sunny Mother's Day of just how much can change with a little time. In the two years, in two years, we have gone from wondering when a vaccine would be made to now talking about fourth dose booster shots. Masking all the time, everywhere, to learning how to be comfortable in situations where we can have the mask off. I think it is a testament to how quickly things can change. To use a tired phrase, hindsight is 2020. Now, this time, reflecting a little bit personally, three years ago, I know I was stuck in a rut, worried I would always be alone. I took the rejection from my family as a testament of how valuable I was as a person. And of course, when family does not accept you for who you are, you can feel worthless. Then change came in little pieces. Monthly dinners with friends I now consider family. Faith that strengthened so I finally answered a call to ministry. A 16-year friendship turned romance and soon-to-be marriage. It is amazing how time can change things and how you understand yourself and the world around you. I must say that in this way, I very much identify with Peter in the Acts of the Apostle who constantly finds his world shaken during the course of this book. With Jesus' ascension to heaven, Peter finds himself in a unique position. The man who once denied Jesus three times and was tested on the depth of his love three times when Jesus visited him after he resurrected, leads a movement to spread the word of Jesus. Now, this is the sort of journey that brings Peter far from home and in touch with people who challenge not only how Peter sees and understands himself, but also his relationship with and understanding of Jesus. The writer of the Gospel of Luke, who also wrote Acts of the Apostles, sets Peter on a course to meet Paul. In this way, our story is set up to hand the narrative over to Paul the Apostle, whose letters, as we know, are central to much of the New Testament. Together, Peter and Paul decide that between them, Peter would preach to the Jews and Paul would focus on the Gentiles. Before Peter has that faithful meeting, however, he feels the Spirit calling him to continue the work of Jesus. He preaches about the Jewish Messiah who came, to the Jewish, who came from the Jewish God to save the Jewish people, who is known as Jesus. At least, this is Peter's initial understanding. Yet, as time passes, Peter is drawn further and further from home, and he keeps meeting those who believe in Jesus, in God, who are Gentiles. As he converts people, and meets believers, Peter finds himself, finds more and more Gentiles who have not become Jewish, yet they still follow Jesus. Peter find, then finds himself in Joppa, being sought out by the loved ones of a believer named Tabitha. He is in the area when she passes, and just like Jesus before him, he commands the dead to rise. Only, instead of a little girl of a Jewish priest, is a believer of Jesus. Sure enough, Tabitha rises, and in this way, Peter finds that not only is his new mission affirmed, but his increasing contact with the world outside of Judea hints at God's greater intentions that span beyond the children of Israel. Now, one of the most fascinating experiences that I've been having in seminary is that as I begin to understand Jesus as a Jew in his Jewish context, I begin to understand him better as a follower and believer in Christ. One of my personal favorites was learning how the imagery of a shepherd looking for a flock was a common in ancient Jewish culture. Sheep are creatures that are prone to wandering away out of curiosity. As creatures, they can be hard to herd and wrangle without losing a few. And in my mind, whenever Jesus spoke about being like a shepherd, I can imagine those who made their livelihood this way sometimes chuckled, sometimes groaned, but mostly rolled their eyes at the idea of finding that one last stubborn sheep or defending them from predators. 
Equally important is that deep in the tradition of the Jewish people is a responsibility to the vulnerable. To many Jews, if you tell them to help the vulnerable, their immediate understanding are widows, orphans, and strangers. We see this echoed in Christianity. Paul mentions it many times, and Peter, as part of his ministry, organizes a group to look after the vulnerable. Tabitha then represents deeds we are to expect from a Christian who is rewarded with eternal life. The clothes of the widows who mourn Tabitha were personally made for them by her. There can be an immense amount of intimacy in making clothes for someone. The process to source the material that suits the wearer needs, to make sure it fits well when done without expectation of payment is an intimate act and labor of love. Here, these widows are so moved by Tabitha's gifts that they bring the clothes to display the good work Tabitha has done to Peter. These widows, who have no one in their lives, would have been left with rags had Tabitha not intervened. From there, I can only imagine that Tabitha's relationships with them all grew from this act of kindness to something so deep that she became central to her community and her death was met with deep sorrow. At the core of our Christian duty to help the unfortunate, we need to ask ourselves, who are the widows, orphans, and strangers of today? When we think what these groups in Jesus's and Peter's time have in common, the short answer is nothing. These vulnerable people lived as outcasts who were often in poverty, or in other words, they had nothing. When we look back to the ancient world, we would realize that widows would struggle to survive without a husband to earn funds for the household. Orphans as children would be unable to fend for themselves and strangers suffer from isolation, being taken advantage of, and being misunderstood. The list of the vulnerable in our modern world is larger than we may realize. The widows of our time, in addition to those who lost a spouse, are those who have survived their families and friends who may have never married or never had children. The orphans are those who lost their family, whether through tragedy of death or being disowned for being true to themselves. Finally, the strangers of our time are those whose lives we don't always understand. We suffer from trauma, mental illness, and addictions. These are the people who are often forgotten. The uniting theme of these groups is that they need someone. Their vulnerability means they are alone and do not always have the means to take care of themselves in the way that they deserve as a child of God. They need family, and sometimes family does not look like those who are linked to them by blood. They look like Tabitha, who took the time to make the widows of her community clothes. They look like the disciple who stood with Jesus' mother as she sobbed at his cross. The one who took Mary into his home when Jesus declared, Woman, this is your son. They look like me and you. Every time we spend a moment to talk to someone who is lonely, or invite someone over for a holiday dinner when we know they would have otherwise been by themselves. A simple action to not abandon the vulnerable can turn into a found family. And that found family, in many ways, encompasses all who God wanted us to find as we help bring our world into the kingdom of God. Which brings me back full circle in recognizing my own journey. Despite being an outcast who lost family who did not support me, despite being, spending years isolated and fearing I would always be alone as some sort of punishment for being trans, I'm here. I did not end up alone. There are women in my life who have been a mother to me in ways that I desperately needed and never had growing up. There are men who constantly show me what it means to be a healthy father figure. There are people who have shown me that if you begin with and end with love and kindness, you can never go wrong. Where others may have given up on outcasts like myself because understanding who we are can be difficult, we as Christians are called to be like a shepherd. We should furiously seek to be there for others like a shepherd that seeks that one lost sheep. 
In this way, we protect the sacred within a person from the predators of this world who will try to rob them of their dignity as a child of God. And who knows? Maybe in the process, you'll find the adopted son, daughter, aunt, uncle, sibling, father, or mother that you never knew you needed in your life. Happy Mother's Day to all. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, I want to thank you for your ongoing support of the ministry and mission of Parkminster United Church. I am the United Church of Canada through the Mission and Service Fund. As we are blessed by the God of wonder and love, let us share the gifts of time, talent, and treasure we have received in blessing to others. Let us commit ourselves to acts of love as we continue to worship through our offering. May the gifts we offer this day, Holy One, bring joy to those whose mornings are hopeless, feed those whose noontimes are filled with hunger, and bring peace to those whose nights are surrounded by fears and worries. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And let us come together in prayer to reflect on and share in the yearnings, the struggles, and the joy of our lives. I'm wondering if you have any concerns or blessings you'd like to share this week. If you're on Zoom, simply type them into the chat. And for those in the sanctuary, I invite you to stand in place, and I'll repeat them for everyone to hear. seeing any in the chat right now, so I'm going to proceed with some that I have here in front of me. 
first one is prayers for Lynn McNiff, who is recovering from COVID and dealing with the pinched sciatic nerve. And prayers for Alice Bacliar, who has just been moved into palliative care at Mount Hope Long Term Care in London. She has lung cancer, plus many other health issues, and is asking for prayers for an end to her earthly life so she may move into her heavenly home. And I'm not seeing any others in the chat right now or in the sanctuary. So let us take our joys and concerns into this time of prayer. Almighty God, Father and Mother of us all, on this Mother's Day, we ask for your blessing and the joy and the sorrow that comes with mothers. Whether we associate this day with happiness, loss, thankfulness, regret, understanding, pain, or a mixture of conflicting emotions. Help us, God, to reach out to you. For we know through Christ's salvation that you can bear our suffering. Through the Holy Spirit, we know you hear our praise. And through the promises you made when we were baptized, we know you hear the words which we keep close and silent in our hearts. Guide us to healing, whether that is mending fractured loving relationships or walking away from deeply painful ones. Help us to find our peace and the knowledge that we are not alone, that we will make a new home with the family you have guided us to. Amen. Sandra, let's repeat the top section and the bottom section each, okay? Right.
Friends, our service has ended. The light of Christ goes with us, leading us towards paths of resurrection. May we follow and be bringers of hope as we return now to our homes, workplaces, and communities. May the Spirit open our eyes anew. And I would like to invite you all to stand for a moment. Look around at the people around you. Look forward. Look behind, look to your side. These are your siblings in Christ. May they always have a home with you. Go out into the world, seeing the face of God in all you meet. Go out into the world, ready to make it a home for all. For the stranger who becomes your neighbor, your neighbor who becomes your friend, your friend who becomes your family. One table in God's kingdom with enough room for everyone. Amen.